Good morning, if everyone could speak towards the Please join us in scooting towards the middle as people are coming in so they can join us here in the pews. And I invite you to join me in our call to worship on this Easter Sunday. We watched them nail him to the cross, but that was not the end of the story. We watched them roll the stone in front of the tomb, but that was not the end of the story. We gather this morning to proclaim the good news. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. You're going to get your Easter exercise today. Please stand again as you are able and join in our opening hymn.
Good morning and happy Easter to everyone here worshiping with us in the sanctuary and those tuning in online. If you're wondering why Easter feels as if it's earlier this year than it has been in the past, well, Easter is based on a lunar calendar, and so it's a movable feast. It can take place as early as March 22nd all the way until April 25th, with some days more common than others. So April 16th is the most common day that Easter falls on. The simple equation for calculating Easter is that it falls on the first Sunday after the first full moon after the spring equinox, (laughs) which doesn't make it any easier to remember when Easter is going to be. But actually for Easter to fall on March 31st, is kind of rare. It's not going to happen again until 2086, at which point I will be 99 years old. I hope that I'm retired by then. We'll have to see how Social Security pans out in the future. I'm hoping that at least it does not rain again on Easter morning until 2086. It picked up right at 955 as people were walking inside. So this is probably the last time that I'm going to be a clergy person when Easter is on March 31st. And I think that's significant because each year on March 31st is also Transgender Day of Visibility. Now, here at Claremont United Church of Christ, our membership represents 43 different cities across Orange, Riverside, Los Angeles, and San Bernardino counties. Sadly, because there are so few large, progressive, inclusive, LGBTQ-friendly churches in the Inland Empire. But that means on a day like today, it is more vital than ever as legislation is being passed that attacks the livelihood of the transgender community to have a place, a sacred place, where our transgender siblings are seen and loved and cherished and reminded that this is a safe place for you and that we stand with you. And there's no better day than Easter Sunday to make sure the transgender community feels visible. And that is because the celebration of Easter is all about being seen. The resurrection of Jesus is a declaration that the dark, hateful, deathly parts of this world will never defeat the life-giving love of Christ that shines into the shadows of our world to make sure that every person knows that they are worthy of God's love. And no law can ever change that. So we are so glad for each person here in our sanctuary and again tuning in with us online. We pray that everybody here today feels seen for exactly who you are and that you know the promise of Easter. The promise of new life, new life wherever you need it, is for you specifically today. Welcome, everyone. I invite everyone to take the blue pew pads here in the sanctuary and to sign in. Pass those down the row. When they get to the end, send them back. You can see who's worshiping next to you today. Maybe greet them by name later in the service. If you're visiting with us, we would love for you to leave a phone number or email address. Pastor Jen and I would like to welcome you later this week. If you're watching online in the chat, we're going to put a link where you can fill out this form digitally. After the service, we invite you to flow into the narthex. There are donuts for you set up by our fellowship board. Thank you to our fellowship board. And then if you go down the path to this building here, we're going to have our egg hunt inside at 10 t- or 11.10. Our five and unders are going to be in a room labeled the Louise Roberts Room. And then at 1120, our six and up are going to be in a room called the Upper Room. This is a no race, no competition egg hunt. Everyone's going to get the same number of eggs. There'll be music playing, a photo booth for you. We also invite you to put flowers on our beautiful flowering cross and take pictures together and enjoy the Easter atmosphere after the service. If you put a lily up in honor or memory of someone, please take the lilies with you afterward. And usually there's lilies left over, so even if you didn't, just look, and if there's a lily there that's still needing a home, please take it with you and bring it and allow your Easter festivities to continue through the day. If you haven't heard, we launched a new worship service three weeks ago called Brunch Church. And every Sunday at 11.15, down in our basement of the building right here, 
we have a space where we just have brunch and listen to music. We come into the middle of your brunch with a little dose of spirituality with the sermon, and then we go back to eating brunch. It is really fun, really good vibes. We're going to have that service today. 11.15 is when it starts. Come anytime, grab some food. Jen will preach again at 11.45. We'll see if the sermon's good enough to hear twice. You can enjoy brunch, get the sermon a second time. We're going to have agua fresca and a mimosa bar, virgin bloody Marys. It's a lot of fun. So even if you're here, you can still join us for brunch church and come back in the future for brunch church as well. And then the party never stops at Claremont UCC. Next Sunday, uh, we're going to have our laundry love event. This is where we go to a laundromat in Pomona for two hours on Sunday morning before the services. We pay for everybody's laundry and just chat with the community. We would love for you to join us for that. And we're launching a great adult education series on climate justice starting next week as well. If you're not on our Friday emails, leave your email in that blue book and we'll be sure to add you so you know what's happening here at Claremont United Church of Christ. Let us continue our worship this morning by joining our voices together in an Easter prayer. Please pray with me. Risen Christ, on this Easter morning, as we rise with you from the shadows of death, fully awakened by grace, we open ourselves to the possibility of new life. We breathe and give thanks for our breath. We see and give thanks for our sight. Along with you, we now shed the rags of our doubt, shame, fear, anxiety, and pain. Let us emerge from the tomb with you and live as Easter people. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you today, church. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with one another by turning and greeting your neighbor. If you're watching online, let us know, where did you find peace this week? We also invite all of our young friends to come forward. So if you have children with us today, please invite them up. Good morning, friends. Oh my goodness, I only heard a few voices and there are so many of us. So on the count of three, we're all gonna say good morning. Ready, one, two, three. Good morning! Oh, what a joyful noise. I am so glad to see all of you on this Easter morning. And now I would like to make sure that you all can see me. So if you can't see me, get into a spot where you can see me because I'm gonna tell a story today. Oh my goodness, so many exciting things are happening today. This sounds like, this sounds like a really good story, my friends. We are gonna wait till after church to tell some more stories, okay? I'm gonna tell a story. I'm gonna tell a story about this cute little caterpillar that I saw outside of my house a few weeks ago. I called him Hubert. And Hubert was just crawling along on my windowsill. He was so cute. And I made sure that he got out to this little butterfly garden that's sort of outside in my, in my um, complex. And uh, has anyone ever heard the story of the very hungry caterpillar? Yes. Oh my goodness, well, oh, we have a hundred times. Well, Hubert ate and ate and ate, but you know what, he kept coming back to see me, just inching a 
along my windowsill. And then after all, oh my goodness. Does he like leaves? Oh my goodness, he likes leaves, that's right. Yes, it's amazing how much they can eat. And so I love seeing Hubert every single morning. But you know what, after a while, I stopped seeing Hubert. What do you think happened? Well, I didn't see him. I did see, though, this chrysalis that was hanging from a branch outside. Do you think Hubert was inside the chrysalis? Yes! Oh, my goodness. And then, one day, I saw Hubert again. And Hubert decided to come with me to church and become, oh, a beautiful butterfly. Let's try that again, huh? Hubert decided one morning to come out of his chrysalis and he emerged as a beautiful butterfly. <laughs> Isn't that fun? Well, you know what, friends? We use this story to talk about Jesus because Jesus was with his friends for a long, long time. And then he went away into a tomb because... And, oh, and something happens, doesn't it? Doesn't it? And what happens? Jesus rises. And like a butterfly, Jesus is transformed. And even though Jesus looks different from how we... Jesus came back and Jesus is with us, transformed in a different way. Jesus comes with us in our hearts, and that is how we get to share the Easter story today. Let's share, let's share a prayer, my friends, and we'll share some, stories, some more stories after church. God, we thank you for Jesus and butterflies, and help us Transform the world with your love. And all God's children said, amen. All right, friends, time to go back to your grown-ups. And grown-ups, you might need to wave or stand so that our young friends can come find you. It is mine. I'll let you do it after church. Does that sound good? Okay. Every aspect of our ministry here at Claremont United Church of Christ, from keeping on the lights of our building that is used by community groups 365 days a year, to our music and children's programs, to the over $100,000 we give to local nonprofit and mission partners of the church each year, every cent is because of the generosity of the people who attend worship here at Claremont UCC. We are so grateful for the ways in which you support our ministry together as a church. I invite our ushers forward as we receive today's offering. You can also find on the last page of your bulletin and on the screen if you're watching at home, a QR code and a text number to contribute digitally. Thank you for giving.
Christ who is alive and among us. We give our Easter gifts this morning with joy and celebration for the new life that springs forth all around us. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 15, verse 40, through chapter 16, verse 8. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph and Sal Salome, who followed him when he was in Galilee and ministered to him. And there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from a centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth, and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw that where the body was laid. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I'm going to let that sit for a second. And then all that had been commanded to them, they told briefly to those around Peter. And afterward, Jesus himself sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. Amen. <laughs> I'll explain why I did that in just a minute. So Mark's story was winding down just as one would expect. The hero of our tale, Jesus of Nazareth, was condemned by the state of Rome to die, which he did on the cross. A bunch of women saw it happen, Mark said. Among them were Mary and the other Mary and Salome. A man named Joseph received permission from Pilate to take Jesus' body down from the cross and place it in a rock tomb, which he did. A bunch of women saw it happen, Mark said. They kept the Sabbath like the faithful disciples that they were, and the next morning they went to anoint his body with spices, as was their tradition. So far, everything is making sense. It's a sad ending, to be sure, but we all saw this coming from the minute Jesus started riling up all the powerful leaders and pointing out their hypocrisies and their distortions of God's love. So they get there, and the tomb is unsealed. The rock is rolled away. That's weird. A young man in a white robe is hanging out inside. They don't recognize him. Let's just assume he's an angel. Mark says the women were alarmed. And I really wish Mark were a more colorful writer here because I wish he would have included some specific phrases that the women said when they saw the angel. I bet their language was just as spicy as the frankincense and myrrh that they had brought that morning. And this unexpected angel tells them, go and tell the disciples and Peter that Jesus is going ahead of you to Galilee, and you'll see him there. Again, I wish Mark had recorded some more specific reactions here, because the women freak out, they sprint out of the tomb, and they say nothing to anyone. The end. 
if that ending to this entire saga of Mark leaves you unnerved, you are not alone. The early church shared our anxiety and decided they needed to write more. Did Mark get distracted here? Did he fall asleep? Did he forget to tell us what happened next? Because there's no way that this story, which ends with the women running out of the tomb, leaves us with this feeling of anxiety and terror, right? I mean, obviously, they told someone something at some point because here we all are 2,000 years later. And so second century manuscript writers began adding more verses to the Gospel of Mark. And I included just two sentences there at the end for you, which were meant to be in italics in your bulletin. But there are actually 12 more verses that were added in the Bible. And even the most conservative Bible scholars will admit that these are not included in the original manuscripts of Mark's Gospel, which is the oldest of all four Gospels. What can we say? We need to know how the story ends. And sorry, Mark, it really can't end like that. A happy ending would have been better, but at baseline, we need a resolution. We need to know if the angel was telling the truth and the women saw Jesus again. We need to know how Peter and the other disciples reacted when Mary and the other Mary and Salome told them what they had seen. In our lives, we also need to know the ending of every story. Will she survive the surgery or not? Will he forgive his brother or will they remain estranged forever? Will they get divorced or will they stay married? Will she complete that 12-step program and stay sober? Will he make the career change or will he stay in the job that's making him miserable? Well, don't ask Mark because he's not going to tell you. He's, he's not here, the angel says with a shrug. Or I don't know, I like to imagine that maybe it was jazz hands. He's not here. <laughs> we don't know because Mark did not spill the tea. We don't have the details. But what he does suggest is that the ending of this story is not the ending of the story. It's always jarring to try and combine Easter morning, a time when we celebrate new life with stuffed bunnies and chocolate eggs and dapper new clothing, with the image of grown women screaming and running out of a cemetery. Happy Easter, everyone. <laughs> we like to think that Good Friday, that was the scary part of the story, the one that we gently caution parents about when bringing their youngsters. Just so you know, Jesus died we whisper apologetically. We extinguish all the candles and we sing sad songs. You might want to drop them off in the nursery for this service. But Mark is trying to suggest that Easter is the scary part of this story. And he's right. An empty tomb with an angel telling these women that Jesus, whom they saw hanging lifeless on a cross just 72 hours before, is in fact alive and on the move? Jesus, whom they had watched Joseph of Arimathea take down from the cross, again, lifeless, wrap in burial cloth, and seal inside the tomb, is in fact alive and on the move? The women must have thought they were losing their minds. Death, the one thing that we are all quite certain about, is suddenly whipped out from under them like a rug. Now nothing makes sense. We can't even count on death the ending that we all thought was the final ending for every human being? I don't know the ending, but death isn't it, Mark says. So yeah, Easter is a little scary. If you believe that the story of your life will end with death, your plans become pretty clear. You're going to simply collect objects and experiences and spend as much time with your loved ones as you can until your time here on earth is up. Perhaps you'll even be able to make some significant changes to leave the world slightly better after you depart. But what if death is not the end? That changes everything. What if, as Mark tells us, death is a doorway? It's an illusion. It's a temporary state. I don't know the ending, but death isn't it, Mark writes. 
Well, now our lives have a new mission. He's in Galilee, the angel says. You'll find him there. You should go and tell everyone. So that's the new mission. Go and find him and then tell everyone. See, Mark doesn't give us the ending, but he doesn't want us to get stuck at the tomb either. Whatever the ending is, he tells us, it didn't happen at the tomb. So don't get stuck wondering whether or not Jesus really rose from the dead. The only way to know is to go to Galilee and see if you can find him. And what was Galilee? Galilee was home for these women and all the disciples. There was nothing special about it. It was the place of daily routines. It was where they worshipped. It's where they cared for their children and elderly family members. Galilee was fishing nets and markets and weddings and funerals, prayers and dinner parties. That's where the next part of this story is found, Mark writes, where we live and work and play and worship. When ordinary people are in the midst of doing ordinary things like feeding the hungry and sharing a meal with friends and playing with children and dropping off soup to the sick person's doorstep and inviting lonely friends into community, that is when you will find Jesus in our midst. When business people decide to do what is right no matter the cost or profit, when flowers are delivered to someone who is grieving, when someone in prison is looked in the eye and told they are more than this moment in their lives, that is when we will find Jesus alive in our midst. When people, peaceful protesters take to the streets to call for an end to war and an end to violence, when someone in recovery is embraced and promised they will not be fighting their addiction alone, when neighbors who disagree on politics can come together and break bread, when the unhoused are treated with kindness and compassion and ask how they can be supported, that is when we find Jesus alive in our midst. I don't know how this story ends, Mark writes, but something new has come into the world. Go home to Galilee and see if you can find him. It seems that the ending of the Easter story is still being written through every generation, through every one of our lives, through every act of kindness and compassion and generosity that we perform, through every stride we make forward for peace. Mark could not give us the ending of the story of Jesus because Jesus is still alive. He's still working among us. He's still guiding and expanding our hearts and our minds. He's still teaching us the lessons he began when he was here among us on earth in bodily form. He's still breaking down our walls and our barriers. He's still giving us courage and hope when we need it the most. It is up to us to look for him, to find him right beside us, and to recognize that he is here just as he promised he would be. As the poet Mary Oliver writes, and this is on the front of your bulletin cover, instructions for living a life, pay attention, be astonished, tell about it. The women fled the tomb in terror that morning, and they said nothing to anyone until they told everyone. And now it's our turn. Amen.
Join me now in a word of prayer. Amazing God, while the resurrection is the greatest miracle of all, filled with wonder and doubt and confusion and joy and hope, on this morning we choose to lean into our belief and our faith in you. We proclaim our belief in the empty tomb, which promises us that you are always doing a new thing. We proclaim our faith that you are always working for our good, that you grieve when we grieve and celebrate when we celebrate, that you call us to be more than who we are in our hardest moments. We proclaim on this Easter Sunday our faith in you, risen Christ, who cannot be forever nailed to a cross or wrapped in burial shrouds, who walks and moves among us even now, inviting us into deeper, richer life through practicing kindness, compassion, and peace to others and to ourselves. We proclaim our belief that you, Holy Spirit, are calling us into holy community, teaching us how to welcome strangers and perform acts of justice and mercy to the least among us. On this Easter morning, we proclaim our faith that you, triune God, cannot and will not be contained, not by books or institutions, not by fear or hatred, not by politics, and certainly not by a tomb. We proclaim our belief in how your light shines in the darkness, and our faith is that the darkness shall not overcome it. And so this morning, as we reaffirm our faith and belief in you and all that you are, we lift our prayers of hope, hope for peace within ourselves and in our world, prayers of healing within ourselves and in our world, and prayers for new life for ourselves and one another. It is with one voice that this church here comes to you in prayer, saying the words you taught us, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, the women who found the tomb empty were astonished. They were terrified, and they could say nothing until they said everything. And now it's our turn to go out and share the story of Jesus' love and the good news of new life with the world. May you go out and do that with peace in your hearts this Easter. In the name of the one who created us, redeems us, and sustains us. Amen. Amen. You're invited to stand for our closing hymn.